in the process of his generation, man discovered that he inhabited a kind of surface zone on what we call the face of the earth. Beneath him was a strange subterranean world, which is early fantasy, stratified and divided into mysterious compartments, as explained or expressed in Dante's concept of the inferno. Above this surface upon which man dwelt, extended the great vistas of space and the human being regarded himself as suspended between two extremes with which he was constantly challenged. He tried to survive and succeeded gradually in his labor of conquering his immediate environment and securing a certain temporal safety for himself and his kind. Yet he remained forever intrigued by his universal orientations. He recognized that in some way he could descend into something less or ascend into something higher. He realized that he was in a middle world, the ancients called it the middle garden, overshadowed by the Olympian heights where dwelt the gods, and preserved and protected from the mysterious forces of a lower region. To this lower region, the Greeks assigned the deity Hades, later the Latin Pluto, lord of wealth and of death. And to the upper region, he assigned spirits from angelic beings upward to the very throne of deity itself. Continuing his analogies with such faculties as were gradually evolving within himself, man also began to contemplate the orientation of his personal life, as this is signified by the body which he inhabits. He discovered that within his own nature was a miniature of all universal procedure. By his own nature, as a human being, he inhabited the middle region of his own nature or of his own constitution. He was not merely a body moving about, he was a body directed by forces within that body. And gradually he came to know these forces as his mental and emotional incentives. He also accepted that behind, beyond and above, his own personality, there was something else. Something that corresponded with the gods. And he began to develop his theological concept, which divided the universe into three parts, heaven, earth, and hell. The philosophic Greeks clarified man's concept of these regions, explaining them philosophically and psychologically. Heaven was the supreme or superior state of things. Earth was the normal sphere of human interaction. And hell was an underworld, not a material world alone, but a world of things living below the level of rationality. Thus minds inhabited earth, really. Bodies inhabited the underworld. Spirits abode in the supreme region. A man's own constitution therefore had three homes or three places of abode according to the level upon which man was examined. 
Gradually also there came into recognition a struggle for orientation. In some way an equilibrium must be maintained. If man developed too many abstract qualities, he lost contact with the human world of things. If he permitted himself to fall below certain levels of action, he found himself also isolated from other creatures of his kind. He did not maintain a standard of integrity suitable to his needs. How he was to interpret these problems gradually became of increasing concern to him. And he began to realize that his primary problem in balance was the balance of an inner and outer life. The balance between the invisible and visible elements of his own nature. Obviously, this balance was made difficult by one environmental circumstance. The world around man he can see, he can touch. He is in constant contact with physical phenomena. And it was almost inevitable that he should associate reality with tangible things. Thus he was impelled by his own experiences and by the faculties of his sensory gamut to orient materially, he became increasingly aware of the advantages of physical adjustments. He found these advantages in terms of comfort, physical security, a creature complacency. He also gradually learned that by various adjustments with physical environment, he was able to conquer certain phases of the world around him. He was also able to improve or increase his own economic capacity. He found that he could accumulate wealth, that he could attain distinction, that he could cultivate fame, that he could hold honorable position in relation to other human beings. He could be a leader or a follower according to his own native resources. Thus he had many inducements, immediate and obvious, to extend his researches and his endeavors downward into his material environment. He gradually came to know, however, that his constant observance of physical things also penalized him. He came to realize that his success as a physical being depended upon the cultivation of things unseen. The respect of his fellow man was not held by his strength alone or by his cunning. There were other attributes which his associates recognized and regarded. One of these was wisdom. Arising from some deep hidden source, Another was courage, which could not be truly cultivated unless man had internal resources available to him. Also, there were abstract kinds of creative mentality, which gave rise to arts, advanced music and literature, and finally uh, united to form the massive structure of religion. Thus man came to know through his experience, that he must balance internal intangibles uh, with external tangible things. He must maintain this equilibrium between himself as a source of creativity and as a physical creature bound within the span of time and place. Working these problems through, contemplating upon them through ages of gradual maturing, the human being ultimately came to believe and to feel out of experience that his greatest power lay within himself, that in some mysterious way he must be led by an invisible element in his own composition.
If he was not so led, he was without direction. And without direction, even his physical advantages were not completely meaningful to him. In gradual contemplation, therefore, he began to recognize the importance of this leading power within his own nature. He began to analyze it, try to understand it. And finally, he summed up his concept in the term soul. He came to accept that the body was an instrument of the soul, an extension of its purposes into his mortal life. Without this soul, without this creativity, without this internal dynamic, he labored in vain. And he also lacked the stability of character, the integrity of purpose, which could give him incentives for physical attainment and achievement. He began to realize that unless he patterned his world, unless he organized and arranged the resources around him to some purpose greater than the mere satisfaction of body comfort, he could not ultimately live with himself. Now in the building of this soul nature or the recognition of it, he realized further that as the body grows, man as a being grows. Evolution operating upon the external of things stimulated internals. And he began to question strongly whether the laws governing him governed body primarily or governed this psychic self within him. And philosophy impelled him to regard it as most probable that the incentives of the vital resources of man are communicated to the body from this intangible but very real source of consciousness within his own compound. It also became important, as we have heard on a philosophical level, that the best should lead the rest. This is a statement of one of the old Greek sophists. He applied it primarily to politics. He declared that state to be best governed, in which the noblest led. And those less enlightened had the simple wisdom to follow in the ways that were best. Applying the same thing to man as a creature, it became obvious that in man the best must lead. And the best part of man was that part which was the source of his dreams, the source of his inspirations and ideals. Thus man must be led by the best level of his own understanding. It also became rather evident that this best level was not a static thing that remained always the same, but was itself constantly changing, growing, unfolding, and enriching. It therefore seemed right and proper that man should cultivate the invisible part of himself, just as assiduously as he cultivated his material faculties and powers. In order to gain skill in a certain art or craft, he disciplined the body, usually under instruction. Perhaps he became an apprentice to some person who excelled in the particular art in which his own interest lay. And through association, through observation and through reflection, he became endowed with the abilities of his teacher and thus became capable of a career of his own. This problem of assisting the best to lead, therefore, not only indicated a recognition of what was best, but a cultivation of the best in order that it might continue to lead and that the body might never catch up to it, or surpass it, or take over those forms of government which belong essentially 
to the soul rather than to the body. It then seemed, and it still seems, advisable and proper that man should cultivate by intent, by purposeful endeavor, this inner life of his own. Because from within this inner life came a maturity of impulse, capable of forever directing the objective person into better ways, into the fulfillment of higher convictions. He then also observed that man is a compound, exists of two interesting values. One is conviction, and the other is the means of its attainment. The conviction came from within. The means for its attainment were supplied by the environment. Thus environment was not important primarily for itself, but because it gave instruments for the expression of conviction, of internal determination to accomplish certain ends. A life that is not strengthened by convictions is a drifting life that leads us from one emergency to another, or a purposeless life which bores us from the cradle to the grave. It is absolutely indispensable that every person have a job, and that this job primarily shall be within himself, and all external and material things shall contribute in some way to the satisfaction of the soul. The individual who is expressing himself, who is moving toward those values which he already perceives to be real, is dedicated. And because he is dedicated, he is eternally busy. And he also has a vision of things worth doing and incentives to accomplish them. On a more psychological level, we have reformed some of these terms, but not essentially the context or the substance involved. In psychology, we hear a great deal about the pressure of environment upon the person. We know that he is modified and changed by environmental circumstances. But we also know that man shares a common environment. The same clouds move in the heavens above all men. The seasons alter around him. The earth has its periods of fertility and sterility. Everywhere, human beings inhabit one grand environment. That part of environment which is more specialized and which may become the source of specific pressures or conditioning forces, is man-made. Man must not only get along with the world, he must get along with others of his own kind, and he must also get along with himself. He learned long ago that until he knew how to get along with himself, he could scarcely exercise any successful management over other affairs. So we have the famous biblical uh, statement that it is the greater victory to conquer self than it is to take a city. This problem of trying to conquer self was more or less difficult for primitive man it did not mean that he had to attain mastery over his soul. That was not his purpose or his end. His end was to gain identity or contact with his soul. And to do this, he had to overcome shadows, negations within himself. He had to overcome ignorance, superstition, and fear. He had to integrate a relationship and build a road inward by which his soul powers could travel into his objective way of life. Man was therefore a link between soul power and nature, and through him constantly a superior energy was moving 
into expression on the material plane of life. As he conceived and considered these values, he also had to look within himself to some degree. And when we look inside, we find a variety of things. One of the most natural discoveries is weakness. We observe as we look in that our incentives are not integrated, that our purposes are not clear even to ourselves. We observe, as St. Paul so well noted, that when we would do good, evil is ever nigh unto us. We find not sufficient integration to permit us to make clear and courageous decisions. We find ourselves always wanting to do better and always continuing to do what we have done. We know, we get up in the morning and we say, today I'm going to really accomplish something. By evening, even the accomplishment itself is forgotten. So we start again with our eternal resolutions. And each resolution coming upon some obstacle or meeting the devitalizing circumstance of confusion loses the name of action. It becomes comp uh, obvious then to the thoughtful person that the self-directive in man is either so obscured that it cannot function or else has not been sufficiently energized so that it may take leadership and direct us in the way that we should go. There are two schools, of course, relating to the nature of the soul and its place in this compound of ours. According to one concept, essentially religious, the soul is always sufficient, but man fails the soul. He permits so much disorganization to remain in himself. He retards so completely the pattern of his higher and most purposeful activities that the soul simply, frankly, does not have a chance. It never is given leadership because it is never recognized. Like an electoral body attempting to appoint executives, the soul is confused and involved in the politics of daily living. Sometimes we wonder how it happens that our mundane governmental affairs go badly. We wonder why certain persons are elected to office and how a democratic structure such as ours can be so indifferent as to the caliber of its leaders. But we do the same thing in ourselves or else we would not do it in the world around us. We are indifferent of our own leadership. We do not support the best in ourselves. We permit executive control to pass from the one leader capable of leading uh, to the uh, lower levels of faculties and propensities which are incapable of vision and incapable of integrated leadership. Because of this compromise, we live in confusion and we die in confusion. And we nearly always gradually develop an acute dissatisfaction Perhaps this dissatisfaction ultimately presses us on to greater achievement. But often by that time, the years are heavy upon us, and we look back uh, regretfully upon a wasted span of years in which much could be accomplished if we had at the beginning the vision we have at the end. Man, however, is entitled to and capable of a greater psychic integration than he is likely to recognize. This integration must, however, come from some kind of effort. Assuming, as the psychologist tells us, that environment works a great change upon our inner lives, we also know that even in the environmental world in which we live, we can nourish the soul. 
and that as surely as we exist at all, we can and must contribute to the integrity and orientation of the psychic focus. Thus we come upon the philosoph philosophical concept, namely that the soul is not all-sufficient at all times, but is susceptible to education, and that the primary end of education is the instruction of the soul, the recognition of it, the liberation of its values, and the clarification of methods by means of which the internal and eternal part of man can administer the integration which we call the personality. Thus, experience instructs the soul. And the soul growing from a purposed discipline becomes more clearly the leader, has greater control and directive because actually the soul must govern by the consent of the governed. It cannot govern otherwise. It must be that the individual earnestly desires this leadership and having made a contact with it in himself must straightforwardly accept this leadership and must acknowledge himself subject to this power. He probably could do this more easily was the soul more available as a pattern. If he really could understand it, if he really could examine it, even intellectually, he would have greater confidence in its important contribution to his living. And in case we have minds running ahead of us on this track, let us also pause for a second to point out that while our discussion this morning deals primarily with the soul's leadership of the body, there is more than this. It goes on beyond this. It goes to the point of consciousness as the pure spirit life in man leading the soul. Now there are many who would like to jump the middle distance. They would like to exchange bodily chaos for spiritual order. But nature has decreed that growth must be gradual and that the individual who has not yet learned to integrate the soul within himself, which is the root of his personality, is not able to control or direct the larger spiritual resources of life. The integration of the soul, then, is the true integration of man. For we are told that God breathed the breath of life into man, and he became a living soul. Therefore, the middle kingdom of the three worlds we have mentioned, heaven, earth, and hell, is, la is actually the abode of souls. Man is part of a race of souls, not a race of bodies, primarily. His true integration is upon a soul level. His true humanity is upon a soul level. And until he is a living soul working in a body, he has not achieved his own humanity. Humanity is not manifested merely by the external works of man, but by the internal leadership of soul over body, or as Gandhi called it, the victory of soul power over physical strength. Now, the determining and directing power of the soul depends, as we have said, upon its leadership. And here again, we have a point that has a parallel in our physical way of life. A friend of mine, a college professor looking for an assignment, was told that there was an opening in philosophy. Could he take the course? He said he thought he could, although it was not his field. But he felt quite convinced that he could keep a day or two ahead of his students. And that by working harder than they did, and by using more mature mental facilities than they possessed, that he could certainly lead the class. He led the class, I rather imagine, indifferently. I don't think it was the outstanding course on the subject. But he did feel that he could lead by keeping ahead of the student body. 
In the same way, the soul, to leave, must keep ahead of the body. And to keep ahead of the body, it must always be better informed. It must always be further advanced, to a degree at least, than the body which it must leave. Thus man must constantly supply the soul with such nutrition or such opportunities as are necessary to preserve its leadership. Nature has established this as a possible and rather natural course of procedure because the soul, nurtured and nourished by experience, by the observations of the faculties and senses, by the constant revelations of the relationships of living is in a position to lead the body. Its own growth is continuously advancing and it has of course the advantage also that the body primarily is not reflective and the soul is. If therefore any reasonable effort is used the leadership of the soul can be maintained and can be advanced creating what we might term ideological content in the compound nature of the individual. The soul's leadership, to a measure at least, depends upon its relative maturity. Always maturity must lead that which is immature. And maturity represents judgment. It represents reason. It also represents the cultivation of the noblest instincts, emotions, and attitudes of man. We will not expect to find the soul of every man equal in its attainments, for this cannot be under the way of life that we know. The substance of soul may be identical in quality and in essence, but the growth of each soul depends largely upon its ability uh, to make use of environmental circumstances and experiences. If, therefore, the individual has taken the position that the purpose of life is to enrich consciousness, enrich soul power, he is likely to live in such a way as to assist in maintaining the leadership of the psychic life. If, however, he chooses to affirm that his outward satisfactions take precedence over everything else, then he is very likely to deflect or to deform testimony so that it will not enrich the psychic life of the individual. One very simple example of this is man's almost inevitable reaction to the things that happen to him. When something goes wrong with his affairs, the first instinct of man is to blame another to blame circumstances, to blame times and conditions. Either his neighbor or the planets are giving him trouble. The more re mature reflection, which must come in connection with the maturity of the individual, would be his instinctive determination to investigate himself, to find out why within himself conditions existed which permitted him to place himself in an unfavorable relationship with other things. Therefore, the constant emphasis of the soul seeker is the emphasis upon understanding. Understanding always takes the bite and bitterness out of things. It rescues the individual from the slough of self-pity. It causes him to organize occurrences instead of blindly striking out against the adversities of fate. And the person who begins to recognize experience as instruction opens the channels for the enrichment of soul quantity and also helps to preserve the leadership of the soul over the body. Thus what we call culture, the unfolding of all refinements, the increasing human devotion to intangibles, all these things 
encourage and vitalize the psychic life of the individual. In primitive times, men built houses for protection only. They put in few windows because those windows could open the way to enemies. As a result, they lived in dark, cold dwellings, little better than huts, and suffered from all of the miseries and physical debilities that result from lack of sanitation and ventilation. By degrees, however, man changed his attitude, and today, in the building of even the most simple private home, we have not only emphasis upon conveniences, commodities, and utilities, but we also have increasing art consciousness. The individual wants to live in a beautiful house, not because this is necessary to his body, but because it is necessary to the contentment of his soul. Thus, by degrees, magnificent institutions of culture have arisen, feeding the invisible life of man. Each individual, however, must choose either to associate himself with these things and thus increase his internal sensitivity, or ignore them and continue on the limited level of his own personal confusion. Out of the improved relationship between the individual and the concept of beauty, or the concept of goodness, or the concept of truth. Out of these increasing and strengthening relationships, man gradually creates a definable nature within himself. By the time he reached our present level of cultural attainment, most of the human beings of the world have attained a measure of psychic integration. Each individual discovered that he had a leadership in himself. The main trouble now is that this leadership is not strong enough to dominate action although it is strong enough to stimulate desire, hope, faith, and belief. It follows from these considerations that most human beings alive today, certainly those in more advanced culture groups, have a clear internal concept of value. They believe certain things. They hope for certain good things. They would be impelled to support that which will advance good things. But there is still a large measure of indifference to the application of things believed to the conduct of world affairs. We still are torn between immediate, between immediate advantage on some level and the long-range program of soul development. Thus, in our day, it is not so much the creation of a soul image as it is the dedication of ourselves to the service of that image. Each one of us recognizes that we know better than we do. By this, it is evident that the power of the soul over the body is beginning to be generally felt. The inner life of man is better today than his outer life. But it is better without sufficient dynamic to bind the two together into an indissolvable partnership. In our world affairs, for example, men of good spirit everywhere believe that peace is better than war, cooperation better than competition, Honesty better than dishonesty. Beauty better than deformity. Virtue better than vice. These things we accept. Yet we do not have the dynamic to press these acceptances to their legitimate applications. We continue to live in a dim haze of hope. 
trusting upon some intangible to achieve the ends for which we should be particularly and personally laboring. Having discovered, for example, that there is a beauty in us, which is our true humanity, the human being uh, takes various attitudes toward this root and source of his own enlightenment. He may cherish it, he may try to guard it against the pressures of environment, or he may believe it to be a sufficient refuge in time of trouble. The result is that humanity divides now into two rather broad groups. We call them extroverts and introverts. The extrovert is an individual moving continually from within himself into environment. He is a person who is still largely concerned with the pressing of his own purposes upon his world. The introvert is the individual whom under the pressure of environment seeks refuge in his own psychic life. He has a tendency to move inwardly uh, toward some intangible but real security. If the world does not understand him, he seeks the consolation of his own soul. To a measure at least, extroversion has created science as we know it the motion of man toward the conquest of his world, a continually unfolding objectivity, motivated and dominated by certain rules and concepts. Introversion inevitably led to the rise of religion, for religion became, to a measure at least, symbolic of the total psychic life of nature. The church was the soul, the ecclesia, the place of peace, where those of contrite spirits assembled to worship, venerate, supplicate, and implore. These sanctuaries were soul images. And in these soul images also we have a high altar. And on that high altar some emblem, figure, or device to signify the unification of our soul conviction. And we have therefore uh, certain personalities, great teachers, prophets, messiahs, religious leaders, who stand for the victory of soul over body. And we uh, center our attention upon these images, striving to keep the codes which they left or follow the example of their conduct. By degrees, therefore, the introvert has come to depend more and more upon the psychic inner life in which conflict is reduced, in which harmony is apparently possible. Philosophy stands between these two extremes warning forever that excessive unbalance in either direction must lead to a deformity of the universal plan. Materialistic development is good to the point that it fulfills a purpose greater than itself. But when it becomes an end in itself, it is not good. Therefore, science is a legitimate and wonderful mead but it is not a perfect end. In the same way, religion is a wonderful means helping man to certain orientation. But when it becomes an end, the individual is inclined to break the necessary bonds between himself and society, to accept a reclusive existence, to depart from the world and worldliness, not because he has conquered it, not because he has understood through it, but because it has hurt him. And as a result of this hurt, he is looking for the bomb in Gilead. He is looking for immediate relief. And he finds that it is sometimes apparently easier to get along with himself than it is with others. He therefore retires into himself 
and frequently becomes hopelessly involved in the psychological immaturity of his own internal life. He depends upon it too heavily. It becomes to him a refuge, and he forgets to sustain it, expecting it to sustain him. Thus we have fanaticisms and intolerances and persecutions in the name of truth, of good, and of God. These things are the result of placing too much weight upon the soul without first instructing it or giving it the values and the powers necessary for leadership or for integration. All in all, however, in spite of these more or less extreme cases, we do find that the soul today, in comparison to the body which it inhabits, represents a degree of maturity in advance of the objective life. The soul is not fully matured, but it is the one power in man which is capable of moving the rest of man. The soul has an aura or a field of emanation from itself which extends into the future even as it extends into the past. It envelops the present with overtones and undertones. The soul therefore gives us certain memories and if we fall back upon them, they may become nostalgic. The soul gives us a link with the past, for it gives us the ability to re-experience things that have happened to others, at least vicariously. The soul also extends into the future, because it gives us the power, through the union of creative and rational faculties, to project now, with almost prophetic insight. It is the soul, therefore, that impels to the motion of progress. For progress is mostly vision fulfilled by labor. Each individual who builds a house works first from a plan, and this plan arises from the skill and ability of his own creative ingenuity or the creative skill of another. Thus the architect must first dream his house. He must see it, he must visualize it, and he must transform this vision into a practical dwelling. Otherwise he would simply have a load of materials delivered and accumulate the house the best he could. Such would not be satisfactory to him. A life built without pattern or archetypal directive is also an accumulation unsatisfactory to the person who is living it. So the soul's directive is the basis of patterned existences and also the basis of man's recognition of the possibility of improvement. The soul is forever pointing out by impulses how things could be better also giving us a certain vicarious, imaginary experience of things better. The soul gives us the possibility of estimating a better level of collective life. It is soul power that works for peace, even as brute force is forever contributing to war. It is the soul in man which has given him the incentive of peace, the incentive of virtue, and of creative activity. Each of these values becomes necessary and most necessary in most critical times. In all emergency, man takes hope from his soul. He endures great pain convinced that it will pass and lead to better things. He labors without hope of reward because he knows that these things must be done. He works with others of his kind for a world which he never expects to live to see. 
simply because such labor is the natural work of the soul. And to labor in this way is to have a richer life than to labor merely for immediate profit or advantage. Gradually then, man's program divided into two brackets, what might be termed a short-range program, catering to body, and a long-range program, dedicated to soul. It is long-range programming which has given us what is good in society. It is short-range thinking that has mutilated this program with war and disaster. The individual then is gradually integrating a concept soul life and he recognizes this life as superior, purposeful and real. He also recognizes that he must have communion with this life in order to sustain him through the emergencies and pressures of objective confusion. Gradually, therefore, his ideal life, his life in principles, his life in realities, has come to be personified or embodied in a psychic entity. And this psychic entity is a kind of over-personality a being nobler, wiser, better than the body which it inhabits, a being to which man turns uh, for leadership and which he gradually comes to identify with his true self. Thus he moves from pure egoism or from complete objective orientation toward unselfishness, toward idealism, and tries to build his life upon this internal focal point. As he does this, he finds, of course, that he must make adjustments. For man cannot serve two masters. And if the integration is to be upon objectives, the soul must suffer. If it is to be upon subjectives and psychic values, then the affairs of the outer life cannot be pressed with the same intensity. The life of man's psychic nature demands the simplification of his material life. And as material living becomes more complex, it becomes evident that it is departing from that order which the soul would naturally bestow. In the Greek philosophy, therefore, the soul is a symbol of order, for it is that which is capable of direction. Its directives can never be contradictory or confusing. But man can so interpret them if he does not make possible their natural expression. But it is against the principles of nature that the body and the soul should declare war against each other. The idea that there must be conflict, that one must be sacrificed upon the altar of the other, and that the person who is rich in soul must be poor in body, or that the person who is rich in body must be poor in soul. These things are opinions, not facts. The fact of the matter lies in the recognition of patterned processes in life. It is not that man gains soul merely by rejecting body, for such was the way of the hermit and the recluse and it did not serve him well. It took him away from the very society that needed his idealistic ministrations. The so-called conflict exists in man's personal indecision. He is not willing to commit himself completely or totally to either position. He cannot commit himself alone to body because he can no longer believe it. He does not wish to commit himself to soul completely for fear that his bodily position or his environmental standing will be hazarded. He is therefore lacking in directive. He has not yet the support of society to recognize that the soul level of his existence is his humanity.
therefore, that the true human being is a living soul in a body. And that uh, it is not the fact that the human being is merely a body and soul. It is the soul that is first. The soul is not the product of the body, but its adjustment depends very largely upon the cooperation of the body in the manifestation of the psychic value. Man working with the problem of soul maturity, the wise, the learned, the good, the mystic, who has had a more direct experience of soul value, comes to certain conclusions, and these are the simple basis of growth. First, where the heart is, there will the treasure be. The individual must make one basic decision, and having made it, he must maintain it, not by a vast and huge expenditure of immediate energy, but by a continual, gradual allegiance strengthening as he strengthens, clarifying as he grows, but always moving sincerely and directly toward the desired end. Recognizing that the soul must manifest through the body and can only make use of the senses and other perceptive channels for either its own instruction or the control of the objective life. These channels of contact must be adequate. And for these channels to be adequate, the individual must relax certain physical pressures which deform the soul image in man, make it impossible of manifestation. Confusion, false activity, excessive opinionism, prejudice, bigotry, intolerance, all of these things lock the soul. They are contrary to its nature. Therefore, it cannot manifest through them. And where they continue constantly to be cultivated or permitted to endure, there appears to arise a conflict between soul and body. This conflict is nothing more or less than the fact that soul will not accept error. It will not accept and acknowledge that which is wrong, nor will it cooperate and sustain that which is contrary to itself. If, therefore, man wishes the security of a strong inner life, he must keep its rules. He must not reject the laws and values indispensable to the maturity of soul power. In order to relax these pressures, the individual surveying his life comes to several interesting conclusions. One is that his nat natural negative instincts, those things which gravitate against soul power, are deeply ingrained within him that he has nourished them and sustained them long and devoutly. Therefore, that he has tremendous patterns of character defect over which he has no immediate control. He cannot simply willfully change himself. He cannot say, I will be good and become good. These things are not gained through the mere expression of will energy. The individual who tries to force a superior code upon himself becomes a psychotic and not a sage. He cannot force these changes. In order to give up anything which is not so, the human being must substantially recognize that it is not so. And in order to have the ability to recognize what is true and what is not true, with sufficient vitality to have this recognition become a moral determinant, the individual must have discrimination. 
He must have an enriching inner life which gives him the skill to perceive the facts of his external actions. The building of this richer internal life is a great evolutionary program. He cannot hasten it beyond a certain degree, but he can retard it. And to a very large degree, man has consistently retarded the growth of his own inner life. He has retarded it either accidentally or intentionally. He accidentally by circumstances, intentionally by a strange kind of stubbornness in which he insists upon clinging to the familiar simply because it does not challenge him. Some have said that they do not wish to be challenged because they know they are not strong enough. To take this attitude is to admit defeat to admit weakness without any incentive to strengthen or correct it. To attain, therefore, a kind of life in which the soul can be leader, the individual has to undertake a gradual program of rehabilitation. However, he should not take the attitude that this is so long, so arduous, and so incredible a task that it totally overwhelms him and that he has no courage to proceed. Man is not expected to be perfect nor required at this stage of his growth to conquer all things or become aware of all things. The growth of understanding is by simple steps, but the rewards are equal to each step. 10% improvement in the life of the average individual would appear to him to be 100% improvement in his circumstances. A complete change in his total life may result from one discovery. And one good habit cultivated or one bad habit broken will be immediately noticeable in the total compound of the personality. It is therefore quite possible for the average individual to improve, even though it may not be immediately possible for him to be perfect. The moment improvement begins, man also receives the additional support of his psychic life force, because this force must always supply him not only the incentive, but the pattern. It is because man is a dreamer and that his dreams arise from the psychic level of his nature. It is because he knows by inner experience certain things not yet visibly demonstrable that he also knows the direction in which he must go. When the individual uh, waves his hands or wrings them, with complete discomfiture and says, I do not know what to do next. I do not know how to do anything. He is not actually stating truths. He is stating excessive expressions of dissatisfaction or negation. Any individual who will keep quiet for five minutes will know what to do next. Let us face it. Millions of persons seek advice every year and pay millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to get it. And the advice they get in most cases is something they already know. The only thing another person can do for them is either to inspire them or shame them into doing what they know they should be doing. This point that man is without a directive, that he is an orphan in the storm, that he is a neglected stepchild of eternity, is simply evasion. Every individual has within himself that which knows what is next. Because he has overtone, he cannot be alive unless he is in a field of energy that extends beyond his material body. Nor can he be a thinker 
except that he exists in a field of mental or psychic energy which extends out from the now into the immediate future. From the things that have happened to him, from his inevitable conclusions and, con and convictions, from deduction and induction, automatically occurring within him, the individual has a very clear vision, not of great things remote, but of immediate things necessary. And his skill is to gain the power, the incentive, to do that which is next. It is the same problem as the Chinese proverb. The longest journey begins with a single step. Each step that we make must be a single step. There is no great seven-league stride for man. But the soul supplies each individual with a picture of the next step for him. For one person, it may be a very short and haltering step, but it is still a step, and the only step that it is reasonable for him to make. Thus, the soul as counselor has advantage over all other counselors, for others outside can know only what they think is right, but the being seeking the leadership of its own soul receives those incentives which are inevitably adapted to that life. The soul in man can only make the next step, and it is this next and inevitable step which the soul within can alone define, regulate, direct, and make immediately and inevitably possible. Because the soul has this strange oracular uh, potential, human beings have long regarded it with a strange, deep, mystical affection. They have sought to understand it. They have really earnestly wished that they might obey its instruction. They recognize remorse as a pain in the soul resulting from wrong conduct. They recognize repentance as the soul's constant reminder that its principles have not been kept. They also gain a certain positive support, a sense of rightness, fitness, and well-being when they sustain the soul and keep its laws. Thus, out of all these experiences, the soul has developed an image which men record within their psychic experience. And one name for this image has been the immortal friend. In some way, the soul is not quite God. It is more like this friendly thing, perhaps implied in the concept of Jesus, who did not refer to his disciples merely as his followers, but call them his friends, his brothers. And the soul is the elder brother of the personality. It is that which, from a somewhat larger perspective, is forever ministering without thought of itself, without selfishness, without ulterior motive. It is the true friend, therefore, because it is that which works forever for our good. Socrates, in defining friendship, pointed out that the friend is not the person who agrees with us necessarily, but the person who inspires us to be greater than our present state. Therefore, the criticism of the sincere friend is more valuable than the applause of fools. It is this sincere friend, therefore, that may bring to us as sole power uh, the twang of conscience, uh, the sense of shame, the realization that we have failed that which is true. 
Such self-censure, however, should not be a cataclysmic incident. The individual who cannot accept it is very immature. Self-censorship is very vital, the best of all things, because it is proof that the soul lives and that principle still is supreme. This self-censorship calls us back from the numerous byways into which we have wandered and puts our feet again upon the straight road. It is therefore far better that this psychic life within us should occasionally plague us with conscience than that we should be left without this leadership. Because the true friend loves us in spite of our faults, but hopes to help us to mend them. And the contact of the soul and body is not normally broken by any fault of the body. It continues patiently to work its way until experience brings man into a conscious realization of value. All over the world there are images. Images to countless deities and saints and sages. And in some mysterious way, these are all crystallizations of man's sole image of the faithful friend. To those who have meditated somewhat deeply upon these subjects, uh, the relationship between the personality and the soul is greatly simplified. Our natural tendency when exploring invisible superiors is veneration, adoration, or worship. But such veneration and adoration is across an interval which we have not bridged. Those who know very little about deity may adore deity. But those who find more and more about these great spiritual values that underlie life come into ever more intimate association with them. Instead of great things being distant and remote, they become intimate, gentle, and kindly. Until finally, the whole universe moves in upon us as the family friend something that we honor and respect, but for which and with which we have kinship. For actually, the soul is of our kin. It is of our nature. It may be an elder brother or a kind relation, but it is something also growing, also unfolding, and with which we can have a real an immediate association on the level of friendliness, of understanding. The wiser friend, perhaps, but then only wiser friends are worth the having. And the better friend is the ever-present help, not necessarily because of the things they do for us, but because of the things they make us do for ourselves. They inspire. And inspiration is a motivation to higher psychic activity. So our friend the soul plays many parts in our lives. Very few persons have many friends. And if in the course of living two or three physical friendships endure, enrich, and become real, then we are indeed fortunate. The reason perhaps why we have not more friends is that we have not greater friendship with the great archetypal association between ourselves and our soul. For the soul is the abode of those relationships which must be refined from possession to renunciation from passion to compassion, and from personal attachment to impersonal understanding. These growths must happen, and as they do, the model of true friendship emerges, taking its proper place 
as one of the kindliest, gentlest, and most valuable of all associations, the voluntary union of persons because of common regard. So the psychic friendship in man causes him instinctively to turn to his own inner life as we would externally turn to some valued confidant. The individual wants to pour out his troubles. So internally, he pours them out to his own soul. He wishes to be understood, and he conceives that perhaps of all things, only his soul can understand him. He seeks comfort in time of sorrow. Therefore, he becomes quiet and seeks in quietude to establish union with a great source of universal consolation and understanding. In his fatigue, weary with worldliness, so weary with cares and responsibilities, he seeks to cultivate the secret garden of his own soul, helping to grow or to improve the plant that lives there, helping to keep it free from weed and protect it from things likely to destroy or inhibit its function. Thus, instinctively, man leans upon the soul. He leans upon it for all things necessary uh, to motivation, to ideal, to the advancement of good purposes and noble endeavors. And he has learned from bitter experience that if he gains all other things, and loses the friendship of his own soul, that he has lost more than he can possibly compensate for by any other accomplishment. So the soul as friend emerges as a pattern, as a symbol of a great teacher, of a gentle associate, and through soul understanding, the immortals gain something of their humanity and come into our lives. The person who is great in soul does not worship greatness. Rather, he recognizes it and honors it with friendship. Friendship for greatness leads not only to the protection of the individual, but to the protection of the great. For we serve those best for whom we have deep and sincere, honest, honorable human regards. It is therefore not good for us to think of the soul only as something infinitely remote and detached, something perfect and divine. It is better for us to think of it as a kind of over-self, an immortal friend, something that exists for love of us, and ultimately that we exist and perfect existence for love of it. If then we have this friendship, it slowly results in man creating an imaginary soul person. A person whom he likes now to regard it as, as his real self. This soul person is luminous, beautiful, kindly, good, possessing the richness of every virtue we have only in part. This soul likeness also is sad. It is the weeping God that stood in the Serapium of Alexandria. It is the eternal good weeping over the world. For this soul is forever saddened by the conduct of its personality. And as parents, though loving children are saddened by their misconduct, yet so saddened still love, still serve, and still endeavor. The soul may appear to us saddened by our own inability to fulfill its works, but it still guides, still leads, and like the good friend, loves us for what we are rather than for what we do. This kind of association gradually creates in man the vision of another kind of human being. By degrees, this soul becomes the composite symbol of humanity. 
the individual suddenly recognizes that this soul image which he has created alone is human. It is not divine, it is human. And in comparison to that image, man is still struggling to attain his own humanity. Instead of man being the great human model of all things, man realizes that he is a kind of embryo, a being unborn into his own humanity, and that his birth is related to his identification with his own soul concept. Thus the soul is the ideal person, the transcendent being of Chinese thought. And every good, every ideal, every principle that we know and experience becomes a kind of offering brought to the matchless altar of this soul. It becomes clothed with every dream and aspiration that we have. Its vestments are made up of our hopes. Its wisdom stands image to our own understanding. Thus, by degrees, we come to a new concept of ourselves. We see that we have within us an immortal principle of graciousness, of beauty, of ideal that it is quite possible to cultivate this, to have it as a constant strength, and that in all things this strength will be modest, that this strength will always be the strength of true nobility, not an offensive manifestation of power, but the quiet dignity of eternal security that this strength is the strength of soul over body, that soul was born to command, and therefore it must command. It never needs to exert authority, because authority is its natural right. It is not authoritarian. It has no desire to conquer bodies. It is the inevitable leader of bodies. And therefore it waits patiently for the body to accept that leadership which is proper. Nor does it want body groveling before it or humiliating itself for it. It wants body to establish a strong friendship, a friendship of recognition of values, a friendship which reveals that the body perfects itself in the service of the soul. Without this association, the body is orphaned and is left without directive and leadership necessary to its own maturity. As man gradually crystallizes within his own consciousness, the soul image, it becomes to him the symbol of his religious conviction, of his moral code, of his ethical aspiration, and through all these things, of his social orientation. What we call the sick soul is the soul that is prevented from being itself by the burden of pressures thrust against it. The soul restored is not merely restored to physical normal expression. It is restored to leadership over the brain, over the body, and over the works of man. Each individual is in slavery until he becomes the voluntary citizen of the world of soul. We are all in some way responsible. No individual is free in the larger sense of the word. Each person has the right to attain a proper labor and to advance that labor under law. This is his birthright. Not that he shall be truly free as we think, free from responsibility, free to do as he pleases. His freedom is his right to keep the truths he knows. His freedom is his privilege of making a voluntary allegiance to superiors. 
and this of allegiance, when it is voluntary, does not become serfdom. But when it is involuntary, it becomes slavery. So man has the right to accept the leadership of the best of himself and to follow that leadership where it leads, always realizing that to obey the superior is more advantageous than to obey anything which is secondary. And to achieve the superior is the most important thing which man can do. And out of this achievement comes his security, his peace of mind, his working operative faith, his understanding, his good hope, and all these things which make life rich and valuable while he is here. Thus, he would like to invite the immortal friend into his house. He would like to have the soul come in to dinner. And he therefore would do what every one of us will do, supposing we hear that some important person, some well-respected friend, some influential citizen is going to come to dinner. Immediately the family uh, begins preparation. The first thing that any housewife will do is to clean house. She must have the place immaculate. It must be completely at its best. And everything possible will be done to impress this distinguished guest with the honor, the integrity, uh, the orderliness, the propriety of this house. The same happens when the soul is invited to live with us. We must prepare for it by putting this house of the personality in order. We must give it the necessary house cleaning. We must prepare those things which we feel are proper to the entertainment of the soul. And we must present our house to our distinguished guest as a proper and orderly establishment which has been lovingly and adequately protected and is therefore a proper symbol of our respectability. <coughs> the body then must be brought into an orderly state and when this is true and this is right, we will then have the guest we desire. For we are assured even by the scriptures that if we build our house according to the law, the eternal God will dwell therein. And even more immediately, if we build our lives reasonably and intelligently, the soul as the friend can be invited to dinner, can be invited to come and live in that house as its respected and wonderful uh, blessing and presence. We must prepare, and out of this new union of soul and body, under leadership of soul, man will not only attain good things for himself, but will permit to move through him all these creative impulses and instincts which will order civilization, which will end the plagues of ignorance and war, will help men to learn to respect and understand each other, will solve the problem of man's inhumanity to man. For these things are contrary to the soul, and even while we perform these wrong actions, we, uh, we experience guilt. And guilt is remorse because we have broken faith with an eternal friend. If we therefore live in this thinking, develop it, and attempt to apply it to ourselves, we will find that every day we can perform some small and gentle service to the soul. This should be our daily worship, not merely that we should clasp our hands in prayer, but that rather each day we shall bring to the altar of the soul some gift, some offering of ourselves, some simple example of a victory of soul over selfishness in our own living. 
as we build this way, as we become devoutly concerned over these things, we will find life will smooth out, that advantages will increase, that problems will be solved more easily, and that the individual will never be in doubt as to the best and wisest course of procedure for himself. Having this certainty, he is no longer the victim of the opinions of others or the negative motions of his external environment. This way brings the soul into our home. It is always really there, but we do not know it. But by an intentional action, we can bring it into manifestation so that it becomes our faithful friend, our immortal teacher, and actually leads us to the realization that it has always been ourselves, and that through this understanding we rise to our humanity and prepare a better world than we have ever known. Time's up. I've been asked to announce that this afternoon at 2 o'clock at our headquarters there will be a discussion on the subject of this morning. This will be under the direction of our headquarters local study group. It will be held at our building on Los Feliz and Griffith Park Boulevards at 2 o'clock and the study group invites as guests anyone who is interested in a further consideration and discussion or exchange of ideas over the talk of this morning. This time I would also like to express my deep appreciation to you for the kind birthday gift which suddenly materialized. And frankly and actually and honestly, I had no idea that it was being done. You probably find that hard to believe, but it is still true. I'd like to also point out that our new program is being prepared and will probably be mailed in the very near future to you if it has not already been. And it will uh, mean that we will have our next lecture here on April 28th. And at that time, the subject of the first lecture will be the effects of the new comet on the affairs of nations and individuals. I'd like to also call to your attention that if you are not on our mailing list and would like to receive notice of our activities, please let us have your name and address this morning and you will receive your program almost immediately. We will also send programs to friends of yours in New York if you will let us have their addresses, as we will be lecturing in New York uh, next week. At the book table there are many items which we hope you will uh, find useful. Perhaps a subscription to Horizon is indicated at this time, or some good textbook relating to our problems. A good textbook would be our lectures on ancient philosophy, which has much to do with this problem of the soul and its relationship to man. We hope, therefore, that you will find the study of this work helpful. Also, we would like to point out that there will be a number of activities at headquarters uh, during the month that I am away. For information about these, please also secure the necessary programs. Last week I made a new recording which will be available in the near future. The subject of it is Why I Believe in Rebirth. The recording will be identical in size and price with the previous one. It will be for delivery sometime soon after April 1st. The recording is finished. All is now that remain to be done is the processing in the laboratory. So that those who are interested in it can either order it for uh, delivery in the near future or bear it in mind. I think uh, it will be an interesting companion to the other record which we made. And now until we see you again, take good care of yourselves, don't get into trouble and make every possible effort to prepare yourself to invite your immortal friend to dinner in your house.